my name is Yoni, and we have quite a, quite a story for you this evening. We're dealing with the Passover and the exodus from Egypt. Uh, we've been following Luke for weeks and weeks now, but we're, we're just stepping outside of that framework a bit tonight to deal with the Passover. And I have quite a bit of information and a little PowerPoint. Hopefully you can all see um, what's up on your screens. And um, I just want to say that some of this is, is going to be right at first, perhaps a little difficult um, because I'm putting certain things into a different sort of perspective. Uh, let, let me just explain. Um, we are at Passover and we're remembering the plight of the Israelites while they were in Egypt. And at the same time, I'm, I'm going to draw attention to a number of parallels between Egyptian conduct and Israelite conduct. Um, and at first, you know, it's going to seem a little, little uncomfortable, but please be patient and understand there's a very big, perhaps even staggering uh, point later on, I think you'll all find very meaningful and beneficial to the whole Exodus study, story. Um, but I'm going to begin with a, a simple question. If a large culture, a large people group, let's say a group from Asia, uh, migrated to Europe, <clears throat> how long would it take for them to integrate, to learn the language, to become European? Well, I'm not suggesting I have any answers, but I would, I would imagine by the second generation, most of them would be speaking the local local languages and dialects. So I, I think of the Israelites who were in Egypt over 400 years, and I'm not suggesting that they didn't know Hebrew. I, I think that many of them still retained part of their old Semitic you know, language, maybe a lot of the culture as well. But um, I am suggesting that they became very fluent in the old Coptic language down in Egypt that we know as ancient Egyptian, and that they became Egyptian in pretty much every sense of the word. The language, the, the style of living, um, perhaps most of the foods. Remember, this is pre-Torah, so they don't have restrictions yet about, you know, what to eat or not to eat. Okay, so I'm, I'm suggesting, and this is, this is part of what I'm saying is a little uncomfortable, that they're pretty much Egyptians. And uh, when God decides to rescue them, he's going to use familiar language and tools. And that's a clue for what we're about to do for the next um, 55 minutes or an hour. So I'm also gonna be using a PowerPoint. I have a lot of, a lot of photos, a, a lot of them are my own from uh, a trip to Egypt a couple years ago. And uh, some of them for, uh, are from online. The first one here is a wall painting from a tomb to Rekmir, a vizier of Luxor down at Thebes. Um, it's, it's about an hour plane ride to the uh, south of Cairo. And it's called Tomb TT100. And it's from the period of Tutmosis the third Heard about 1440s BC. And you can see that there's workers, they may be slaves, they're, they're working with bricks, they're building things. Um, I don't know if they're slaves, I don't know if they're workers, we, we don't have that description. But um, I wanted to give you, you know, just a little taste of things here. We're, when we think of the Exodus in Egypt, we, we think of slavery and, and hard labor. And there are quite a few wall paintings and, and uh, a lot of evidence of this actual fact, all right? This is a, a photo that I got online. It's from a place northwestern Egypt, a little oasis called Siwa. And, and that's mostly adobe, mud brick, and um, brick. So I thought it's kind of interesting. There's still places where they continue to make mud bricks and Adobe style. If you've ever been around Cairo, Memphis, uh, most of that lower delta is muddy. There's a lot of clay and then of course there's sand, but not a lot of rock. So people naturally built with, with mud, clay. <clears throat> this is from the same tomb um, down at the Valley of the Kings. 
This is either a slave or a worker who's being punished. Um, and this is the sort of imagery I've always had in my mind with the Israelites, how they were treated uh, for the better part of 400 years in Egypt. <clears throat> now, um, this next one is Ramses II, and he's got some military captives, uh, a Nubian, a Syrian, and a Libyan. And we know a lot about Ramses II, and, and many, many uh, of us, Bible scholars and lots of us uh, that, I guess, follow these subjects, the Ramses period is, is where we like to try to place the exodus. So Ramses II is, is a, to me, he's a likely candidate. Uh, he was, um, in my opinion, he may have been cruel, but he was certainly about conquest and there are a lot of, you know, military campaigns and lots of prisoners and, and slaves and so forth. Um, this next one is a Shutterstock photo because my own didn't turn out so great. Marsha probably had a better one. Um, this is also uh, Ramses II with a group of Hittite warriors that he's captured. And um, this is on one of the Karnak temple complex walls. And if you've been to Karnak, you're almost overwhelmed with how many wall carvings there are and campaigns and, and you know, uh, accomplishments of pharaohs, both male and female pharaohs, uh, by the way. When we think of the first Passover and the exodus from Egypt, we think of the end of bitter slavery for the Hebrew people. It is most everything we read and remember during the Passover meal, the Haggadah, the tradition or the telling of the story. In every Jewish home is full of references and traditions and scriptures. Um, for example, Genesis 15, verses 13 through 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be, a, will be strangers in a country not their own, and they'll be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. So we tell this story annually. It's a biblical command to last forever, Exodus 12, verse 14. And this day will be a memorial for you, and you are to celebrate it as a feast unto the Lord, as a permanent statue for generations to come. Exodus 12, verse 24. And you are to keep this command as a permanent statue for you and for your descendants. All right. So we, we have these biblical commands to keep this meal and to think about these things. But for every person, any person who's ever been to Egypt, like Marsha, Gary, I know, has also been. Uh, another narrative becomes apparent almost immediately. And it's a bit of a challenge to begin to find, you know, uh, some of the same things we read about in scripture. You know, where are the things that the Israelite, you know, where, what did they build? And we get these, some of them are traditions, and some of them are from antiquity. For example, Josephus may be the first um, person to suggest that Israelites helped build the pyramids, all right? Um, Menachem Begin also said the same thing in the 1970s. So, you know, certain, certain ideas get started and they may not be so accurate. Um, that's because there's a lot of stuff documented in Egypt. In fact, there's, there's almost copious amounts of information about who built what, what people group they used, you know, Nubian uh, workers. Um, and the pyramids, most of them, if not all of them, are prior to our period of focus for the Israelites while they're there. So it doesn't make sense. I mean, they're, they're, they're definitely emblems, you know, so we think of them, but it's not necessarily true that the Israelites built them. In fact, we find that most of these monuments and major structures are built by paid workers, skilled laborers, and then also they use farmers during the off seasons. We've got text for these. Now, if you're interested, there's a lot of material out of UCLA. There's an encyclopedia of Egyptology, and I found myself just um, gobbling up information in the last few weeks. So if any of you are interested, I can send you the link to one of the articles by um, Antonio Loprieno, Slavery and Servitude, 
and again, Encyclopedia of Egyptology out of UCLA, a, a very, very nice source. So we have skilled workers, we have people who, you know, are hired basically to build certain things. Yeah, maybe they use some slaves too, but most of the monuments, it seems, and also the tombs are built by people who, who know what they're doing. This is uh, my family and I at the um, Giza pyramid, that's a Cheops pyramid in the background. Uh, these monuments are everywhere. Uh, there's hundreds of them. As a matter of fact, there's more pyramids in Sudan than there are even in Egypt. Really? Uh, so it's a remarkable thing on the landscape to see these and you can see them for miles and miles. They are amazing. Um, this next photo is one of the Egyptian gods. It, it's, it's a little curious because at first you want to think it's uh, Anubis, but it's actually a person, a, a god named Pnum, uh, Knubis. Um, and this is from the tomb of Ramses III in the Valley of the Kings. This is my own photo. Um, he is uh, a water and fertility god, and he's in this tomb. And you'll notice he's got two left hands. Now, I'm only drawing attention to this is because, and I'm not suggesting this is the reason, but it could be. At the time this painting was being made, it was actually a workers' revolt in the region of Luxor. And um, when, when the workers were preparing the tomb of Ramses III, and this is 12th century BC, they went on strike because they were not being paid. And these were skilled craftsmen. Um, and I just wonder if, if one of these painters said, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna give them two left hands. I just, I'm so done. <laughs> they're, not gonna, they're not gonna pay us. I'm gonna leave behind my own signature here. <laughs> I don't know, I had a little fun with that. But um, the point of, the, the bigger point is that uh, the Egyptians did use a lot of skilled craftsmen. So, you know, when you go there, you're trying to figure out well, what did the Israelites build? Where, where were they? And, and it's a little perplexing, I think, at fir first, but I'm not going to um, stay on that track too long here. Um, we, we basically know there's two or three different categories of slaves. You have prisoners of war, and a lot of those are used as forced labor, uh, corvée type of work where they might use a bunch of guys to dig a canal. And there's a place mentioned in the Exodus called Pihahirot, the mouth of the, maybe it's a, a, a dike, um, a channel, an aqueduct of sorts. You know, you could use captured military men to do a project like that. So, uh, and then we also have indentured servants, temple servants, and, um, you know, obviously, uh, you can abuse servants, um, but quite often you'll find that these, these indentured servants in Egypt, especially during the old kingdom, um, even prisoners of war, they could work their way up the system and even gain leadership roles and intermarry with Egyptians, just like the Joseph story. And I, I just found that very fascinating. So there's a lot of text showing that some of these former slaves become more like indentured, um, belonging to a household, they intermarry, and they, they rise up the chain, and there's not really a, a restriction. So to the credit of the Egyptians at that time period, they, they seem to allow people to integrate um, in a relatively um, um, humane manner. Yoni, yes. is, is Goshen identifiable these days? Um, I mean, we still like to put a stamp on the map just to the north and east of Cairo. Um, do people living there call it Goshen? I don't think so, but I'm pretty sure we, everyone is pretty comfortable with that eastern part of the delta um, to be ancient Goshen. And, and, I, and there are actually a lot of, there's a lot of texts that you could, you could use to sort of prove that um, region. Um, Thanks. Okay. I'm not going to go into that tonight. During the Middle Kingdom, and we're talking about pre-1500 BC, um, we have quite a few texts that talk about slaves becoming private property. They can be bought and sold. They could also own property 
and become citizens by marriage. And, and I found that, again, to be sort of enlightening. Um, and here's a, a very interesting point. This is, this is also from the Middle Kingdom era. The greater Egyptian community might also enter into a type of national service due to an unstoppable, um, an unstable economy and growing debts, which would lead people to sell themselves into servitude. Um, and this can happen also during times of famine, for example. Um, the same point is mentioned in Genesis 47, 13 through 19. And I'll go ahead and read this. Genesis 47, 13 through 19. There was no food, however, in the whole region because of the famine. It was so severe. It was severe. Both Egypt and Canaan wasted away because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money that was to be found in Egypt and Canaan in payment for grain that they were buying, and he brought it to Pharaoh's palace. When the money uh, of the people of Egypt and Canaan was gone, all Egypt came to Joseph and said, give us food. Why should we die before our eyes? Our money is all gone. Then bring your livestock, Joseph said. I will sell your food in exchange for the livestock since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph and he gave them food in exchange for their horses, their sheep and goats and cattle and donkeys. And he brought, and he brought them through the year with food in exchange for all their livestock. When that year was gone, when that year was over, sorry, they came to him in the following year and said, we cannot hide from our Lord the fact that since our money is gone and our livestock belongs to you, there is nothing left for us, Lord, except our bodies and our land. Why should we perish before your eyes? We and all of our land are yours as well. Buy us and our land in exchange for food, and we with our land will be in bondage to Pharaoh. Give us seed so that we may not die, that we may live, and that the land may not become desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. The Egyptians, one and all, sold their fields because the famine was too severe for them. And uh, the land became Pharaoh's, and Joseph reduced the people's the people to servitude from one end of Egypt to the other. However, he did not buy the land of the priests because they did not receive a regular allotment from Pharaoh and had food enough from the allotment from Pharaoh that he gave them. That is why they did not, did not sell their land. So that little tract of Genesis 47 tells you that at times it was so harsh in Egypt that the Egyptians basically are reduced to servitude to Pharaoh, the whole country with the exception of some priests. I found that very interesting because we have complementary texts in Egyptian sources. Um, quite a fascinating thing. What you're saying, Which, Johnny, really, is aren't you saying that because of the way Joseph was organizing the situation, he's almost responsible for, because I actually don't, I have actually says, we will become Pharaoh's slaves in my right. book. Right. So it's incredible that 400 years later, these are we, we're really talking about the same people to some, to some extent. I, I think it's a key passage it's to understanding key, yeah. what happens to everyone in Egypt, including Israelites, because we're talking about the period of Joseph. So it brings me to a question. Did some of the Israelites also own slaves as they exited Egypt? And I'm not going to say yes, but when they went out of Egypt, and this is Exodus 12, verse 38, and you can, you can decipher this on your own. Um, and a mixed multitude went up also with them, flocks and herds, and even much cattle. Um, mixed multitude, Erev Rav, went up with them. The question arises, what does mixed mean? Some have suggested they were slaves, others... Um, that they, this is a result of mixed marriages. Later on in the book of Nehemiah, uh, he uses the same term when he is addressing intermarriages and um, Nehemiah 13, verse 3. So some suggest that uh, it, it, it applies to mixed marriages. Others suggest that Israelites are bringing out potential um, non-Egyptian or, you know, some some category, but potentially also servants. It, it, it raises an interesting question. <clears throat> All right. 
Because you could say, you know, my right, you could say that Israel, the, 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 the slaves aren't really identified as, 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 as Jews. I mean, we assume it. Right. But if they're coming out, I've always understood the mixed multitude was that they were Jews and they're bringing out the Egyptians with them. But what you said is that in effect, they've been sitting there for 400 years. They've all become one and the same. I hate to make a suggestion like that, but I believe that's what we're talking about. I, that's why at the beginning of this, I mentioned that it, it's, it's almost smart at this moment to think of the Israelites as Egyptian. They're maybe a subgroup or, um, you know, they all live in one area, but I, I see them as, as behaving um, very much like all the other people around them. This is 400 years. So that is a long time not to assimilate to a large degree. Um, I don't want to call them pagan, <laughs> but it is pre-Torah. So it's, it's a curious moment in, in our biblical narrative. So the Torah code for slaves established at Mount Sinai. I just want probably a good time to read this. This is Exodus 21, and I'm just going to read um, a couple of verses here. Exodus 21, 1 through 4. Now, these are the rules. Now, by the way, in Egypt, they don't have rules for slavery. There's not a written code. There's not a legal system. Uh, as a matter of fact, slavery seems to just be sort of haphazard. In fact, maybe more economic than anything else. But in scripture, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, they do get rules about slaves. And this is part of what is going to set them apart. Now, these are the rules that you shall set before them when you buy a Hebrew slave. Now, that first sentence kind of jars me a bit. Here they just come from slavery. Why would any Hebrew have another Hebrew as a slave? The, you know, we're thinking about the Passover meal, freedom from slavery. But then you also think, you know what? Indentured servants, sometimes that is an ideal place to be if you don't have the skills to be independent, to be working for someone, living with someone, they take care of you, you work for them. You know what? That's not so bad. Um, I feel like I've been an indentured servant for a couple of occasions here, um, even in Jerusalem, when I first arrived, volunteering for different people and sort of living with them and they would feed me and then I would work. Um, the difference for a Hebrew slave is that he shall serve six years and in the seventh year he shall go out free for nothing. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. <laughs> if he comes in married, his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall remain the masters and he shall go out alone. Now that seems a little harsh, except it says, but if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to God and he shall bring him to the door of the doorpost. Um, and his master shall bore his ear through with an owl, and he shall be a slave forever. So um, that's, you know, it's, it seems harsh to our modern ears, but I still would maintain that there was something comforting about serving a family, serving a master, especially if he's kind, and, and dedicating your life to a family if you don't have the tools to be independent yourself, all right? Um, there are two more sections in the Torah that deal with slaves, how they should be treated. Leviticus 25, 39 through 43 describes how to treat Hebrew slaves. Again, a maximum of six years. And Leviticus 25, 45 and 46 deals with non-Israelite or probably Canaanite slaves, which is considerably more harsh or harsher. So, uh, for example, a person could have a Canaanite slave for life and pass that slave on to his children and their children. That's, um, that seems very harsh to me. Even compared to 
most of the references I find of slavery in Egypt. That seems a little bit harsh. So I, I was troubled by that. Um, and I'll let you all be troubled too for a little bit. And later on, we may come back to this. I'm getting to part two, and this is what um, I would describe as something that the Egyptians were absolutely consumed with. They were consumed with the afterlife. Every single thing, every aspect of their earthly life was involved processing and preparing for the afterlife. Their monuments, their tombs, their temples, their engravings, their paintings, it's all in preparation for what is called the duat, the afterlife. When a person dies, they are guided by a dog named Anubis. Um, man's best friend in life is also his best friend in the afterlife, so to speak. And the first station that a person experiences in the afterlife is a place where there is a scale and they weigh the person's heart against a feather. All right, so the next slide here is, this is not my own photo, my own photo of the scroll that we saw in the Egyptian museum that was glass in front of it. So I couldn't, I couldn't filter out the glass glare. So none of my photos of this really turned out so well, but this is what they call in modern times, the book of the dead. It's probably better to think of it as the book, uh, a guideline to how you deal with the afterlife. What you say when you get to first certain stations, how you behave, certain gifts you give, um, incantations if you're in a, in a desperate place. But the first station, you can see the scales. I don't know, if, um, can you all see my cursor? Maybe not. Um, so you have the dog-headed person, God, Anubis, and he's at this scale. And to, to the left of him, you have a heart. It's tiny. And then to the right of him, um, right behind the back of uh, Sobek, that's the god of the Nile, you have a feather. And the heart is weighed against this feather. If the heart is heavier than the feather, that person uh, is finished. His soul is finished and Solbeck gobbles up the heart and you're done. Now this, this is Egyptian mythology, obviously. Um, it's a very developed mythology. Um, this scroll would be quite expensive. To have someone make this scroll for you could cost you a lifetime of earnings. And so the average Egyptian wouldn't be able to afford this. Only the kings, the pharaohs, the... Um, the aristocracy, the, the wealthy could afford something like this. And the person is actually buried with it because the thought was you could read it and know what to expect at each station in the afterlife. All right. Um, here's the next photo. This is at the entrance of the tomb of Ramses III. Um, I didn't get the best angle on this, but you get the idea. That's a goddess named Mat, and she has a feather on her head. I also want to point not only to the feather, but to the left of the feather, you can see a duck. And to the left of the duck, you should be able to see where two cartouches used to be side by side, and they've been chiseled out. Um, that happened, I think, um, in early Christian period. Somebody got in there and did some chiseling. So she's the goddess that provides the feather and so on. Um, and here's another scene. Here's the Book of the Dead again, and you can see the scales, you can see Anubis, you can see the heart and the feather. Things are being weighed out. To the left, you've got a person in white, and to the left of that is, uh, again, Mat with, she's holding an Ankh in her hand. All right, so this is, this is the first station where your heart is weighed against a feather. Um, let's see. The Book of the Dead also, you know, includes stages in the journey where there might be hideous creatures. If you survive the first part, you know, if, you're, if your heart was same weight or lighter than the feather, you get to move on. And while you're moving on, you might encounter uh, horrifying creatures that, that want to devour you. But if you look um, 
Can can you all see my my mouse, my cursor? Uh, yeah, it's blue in my. Yeah. My all right. So you have Pharaoh Ramses the Third. You have this hideous creature, and you have this incantation that the Pharaoh is supposed to say so that this creature won't devour his soul. All right. So this is some of the guidelines from this journey, and there's fear at every stage. Is one of the things I want to point out. You're in the afterlife and you think all is well, but no, you have to pass all of these hurdles. And there is a, I would say there's a very serious fear-based element to this whole system, all right? If the heart is deceitful in this life, um, they would they would often, often, often put a scarab beetle over the chest of the dead person so that the heart wouldn't uh, give away all of its secrets. So it's, 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 there's this whole thing. I don't want to get into all the stuff. I'm just kind of giving you an overview. The key point here is that the average person uh, would not be able to purchase such an expensive scroll. And um, again, it, the, this whole thing is a fear-based system, a dreadful existence, I think, if you're in the lower classes and you can't oh, afford it. Yoni, are you saying that buying this, having a scroll like this or buying the scroll um, is some form of protection. It's some sort of, I mean, these are presumably these, these scrolls are on the walls of, of tombs or things like that. So you've just talked about people buying them. I mean, it's, it's like, so you, you, you would really be buying your, your tomb or you would engraving your tomb and you would have these signs on it to sort of hope that your heart is light enough when you get there, whatever. Right, but there's a, there's a physical scroll that you could also buy, you know. Oh, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's like a book, consider it a book that right. you take with you. Now, if you've got the money to have it in, you know, painted on the tomb walls of your, 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 your final resting place, you know, that that's, I guess, for the wealthy. Um, I, I'm going to move on. I don't want to run out of time here. The next frame is a symbol of life for the ancient Egyptians, and it was also a symbol of the afterlife. And if you look closely, um, you can see that symbol is prolific. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor right now, but I I'm pointing to an unk. You, it, it, it slipped off the screen. Okay, never mind. So you know, oh, I want it back. All sorts of places. Uh, for example, here's another. Um, I believe this is Ramses the Third again. Uh, this was at the Egyptian Museum, and I don't remember. Um, I have to look that up. But you can see the ankh is 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 everywhere. It's on all kinds of you know temple engravings, and it's in paintings. And, and um, it's a symbol of life in the current life and the afterlife. Um, so I'm going to come back to that later on. When you, um, when you go to Egypt, you go to the Grand Museum when it opens, one of the first things that you'll probably see is an embalming um, table. And it's, it's sloped, it's beveled. Uh, and there's drainage. This is where a dead person's body would be prepared for, um, you know, for mummification. And they're going to use all sorts of things, um, even including sometimes salts from the Dead Sea, bitumen, um, nitron, all kinds of things that to help preserve, including clay and, and sawdust and, and pitch and things like that. So this is an embalming table. And uh, these are called canopic jars. So when they embalm a person, they remove several things. They remove, by the way, they remove the brain and it's discarded because you clearly don't need that in the afterlife. But the canopic jars would contain uh, the liver, the stomach, the intestines, and the lungs, all right? Kidneys are also part of it but they're a little difficult to remove. They are replaced with the heart back into the carcass at a later, at a later stage. So the heart and kidneys remain with the body. Now, I found that very, very interesting. So I'm gonna read, let's see, here's some more canopic jars. Let me read this verse to you. 
Um, by the way, these are King Tut's canopic jars. Ani Adonai choker lev vebochen kalayot. I, the Lord, search or judge the heart. I judge the kidneys. So you think about that scale at the beginning of this afterlife, afterlife process for the Egyptians, weighing the heart in the balance. It's interesting, the heart and kidneys play a role in this verse in Jeremiah. So I, I, I wonder if there's, um, you know, a, a memory, a remnant of this, this time in Egypt clear on to Jeremiah's period. <clears throat> All right. And then another question. We saw a lot of sarcophagi. Um, this is the um, King Tut's grandmother. Her name was Tuya, and she's married to a man named Yuya. Yuya and Tuya. Um, <clears throat> taking a look at this and thinking about the Israelites and thinking about Joseph. Did you know, and of course you do, Exodus 13, 19, Joseph's bones were in a box and they took that box with them. The Israelites took the bones of Joseph with them. Was it a box like this? Think of who Joseph was. He makes it to the higher echelons of Egyptian um, um, government. And perhaps he was embalmed, like you might expect a king or uh, a noble of that time. It's a very interesting thought. All right, keep in mind, I'm still, I'm classifying the Israelites as a group of Egyptians, and they're doing things that Egyptians do. I'm at part three, but it might take us a while to get through this, so I hope I can make it. <clears throat> This is not my photo. Uh, I failed to get to this place in Karnak. I don't know if Marsha made it, but this is called the White Chapel. It's pretty early, um, 1900s BC. And I'm immediately, I, it just struck me when I saw this photo. Um, this is a temple, and up in the, in the middle of the temple, you can see a little altar there, probably an incense altar. Um, Exodus chapter 20, verse 26. Do not climb up onto my altar with steps so that your nakedness might be revealed. Interesting. Um, we have both steps and a ramp here. Now, I remember hearing this verse as a young as a young boy. Actually, my father had quite an interest in the tabernacle and and how it was put together and all the specifics. and And I remember him talking about why a ramp, why not steps? And steps, you know, you might your skirt might flap. People might be able to see a, a bit up the skirt. That's not supposed to happen. You're supposed to keep focus on the right things and not be distracted. Um, Fascinating parallel, all right? But are you saying this has got, this has only got ramps or it has got steps and a ramp? This one has steps and a ramp. And that's why my, my eyes sort of boggled at that moment when I realized, oh, well, there may have already been a tradition in Egypt with ramps instead of steps. Right. All right. I think I'll skip uh, a little bit here. Incense altars. Uh, almost all the temples have incense altars throughout the older, especially the Middle Kingdom and into the New Kingdom. So the concept of burning incense, frankincense, myrrh, um, is a feature of pretty much all the temples. So that's not so different either. By the way, during my tours, I always ask my groups, you know, if we're, we're, if we're standing in an ancient temple ruin, um, maybe it's a pagan temple ruin, I'll, I'll ask them. So when you look around at the furniture, what, what is different between God's temple and everything else? And if you look at the furniture and, and all the implements, the truth is you don't find many differences. 
So then you have to ask yourself, what is the difference between the God of Israel and all the other gods? And that's where you start to obviously see major differences. But the, the tools, um, the implements of the structures themselves, the orientation, not much difference at all. In fact, pretty much the same. How about a golden calf? Now, this is one of King Tut's tomb um, treasures found in 1922. And some people think that the cow might represent Hathor or Newt, as you were talking about earlier, Marsha. Um, all three of these are female deities. All three of these can be um, represented with a, a cow. Uh, so we're not really sure. Could be a sort of a conflating of all three of them into one image. So when the Israelites build a golden calf, they're building something that they, they've obviously seen, they know about, and somehow this may give them comfort. The breastplate for the priests. Now, the Hoshen, how we understand the Hoshen, it's got 12 gemstones, precious stones. It's the thing that the high priest would wear. Um, Yet, I can also see breastplates used by pharaohs. We know that their priests in temples also had breastplates. This is King Tut. Um, by the way, I just want to point to the scarab in the middle, which covers the heart, the beetle. All right, and above the beetle, you have two cartouches. Quite often, cartouches come in pairs like that. Um, and all of those are precious stones, lapis lazuli, and all kinds of you know, amethyst, maybe some rubies, and all of that is inlaid into gold, just like we would expect the high priests of the tabernacle. Are you okay so far? All right. Um, winged creatures. Now, I don't know about, about you, Marsha, but everywhere I looked, I saw winged creatures, and they could be... Um, that's, that's another one of King Tut's breastplates. This is as well, that's Horus, or maybe it's the sun god Ra. He could also be a falcon. Winged creatures. So they're everywhere. They're, you know, in tombs, they're on sarcophagus, sarcophagus uh, covers. Let's see, which one is this slide? Yeah. Um, these, these here are inside Ramses the third's, no, no, sorry. Sorry, these are, this is the temple of Khonsu built by Ramses the third, which is at Karnak. And this is not my photo because I didn't go into this temple, but you can see serpents with wings, birds with wings, wings everywhere, all right? The falcon is one of the important symbols for Egypt. And um, you notice on coffin covers, the, this is a sarcophagus protective box and made out of granite. And there you have, that's either Mat or Isis um, with her wings spread. This is in the um, museum, the Louvre at uh, Paris. And this one really caught my attention. This is King Tut's, this is also not my photo because I wasn't, uh, I didn't actually see this when we were at the museum. They, they may have already moved it. But this is the, the, the coffin cover, the sarcophagus cover for the, for the wooden coffin for King Tut. And look at the winged, you know, creatures, goddesses. So it's a reminder for me, it's a reminder of the Ark of the Covenant on top of the Ark. We had two winged creatures without faces, but, and I, I realize they're special and amazing, but it's also similar to things that the Egyptians would have known, all right? This is Anubis. He sits on a golden um, box container, and you've got Holes you can carry the whole contraption with. That's my daughter Milana there in front. Um, now it's a gold, it, it's a wooden box with gold 
covering, just like the Ark of the Covenant in, in pretty much every way except for Anubis. I don't know what's in Anubis's box, could be dog food, I don't know. Um, but I was also, you know, I, I stood there and stared at that for a long time. And I have to say that it just, it really caught my attention. The Ark of the Covenant might have looked very, very similar to this. We also were told that it's the same dimensions. It may be the same dimensions as well. That, that was something one of our, uh, that we heard as well. And it looks as though it's carried on poles. I mean, the way that the, the Ark is, is carried on, you know, poles. Unfortunately, our photo, and this is my son taking this photo, we, we should have panned down a bit. We should have got a, a wider view to see the... Yeah, but you, you can see it pretty clearly on the bottom. That the, right. It has got to... It's sitting on some sort of a shelf or whatever, and it's being carried with poles. Right. It's, it, you know, theoretically, it's identical. Okay. Amazing. This is from the museum at Luxor which I found to be quite a great experience, to be honest. You, you know, you can sort of grow weary of museums after a while, but this, this was a smaller, I don't know if you were there, Marsha, but it was a smaller museum. And it was, uh, the way it was laid out was very, very helpful. It put a lot of things into perspective for me. But I wanna speak about this, um, this particular uh, piece. This is Akhenaten. He was a pharaoh in Egypt who reigned over the country for about 17 years between 1353 to 1335. When he ascended the throne, his name was Amenhotep the fourth. Amenhotep Amun would be uh, the old Egyptian way of talking about the sun god. Um, but in, his sixth, in the sixth year of he, his rule, he changed his name to Aken Aten which uh, means something like the benevolent one of Aten, the sun disk, we think. And he declared that Aten was the only God for all of Egypt. So they actually had a moment for several years, in fact, of a monotheistic movement. And um, when, when he died, of course, immediately afterward, they re-ushered re in everything else. The, the old system took over again. But I find that very fascinating. I don't know... Um, if there's a direct parallel between him and, and what is happening to the Israelites. But I, I just found that very, very fascinating that we would have a monotheistic moment, um, 14th century BC, which could, uh, again, be very, very close to the time of the Exodus. All right. Um, how much time do I have? Okay. I want to point to this is inside Ramses the third his tomb at the Valley of the Kings but I want to point above the heads of my children to the two cartouche uh, engravings that are painted as well and just to make a, a mention that for the most part when you have an official something official uh, a statement a sometimes it's a story like the life story of Ramses the third might be in that cartouche but it's official. And they often come in pairs when it's official. And I kept noticing this. So naturally, um, I started thinking of the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of stone. Here we have in the Petrie, Flinders Petrie Museum in, in London, an unfinished work from 13th century BC in the time period of Merneptah. If, if I were to wager, uh, if I were the kind of person to make a bet, I would also suggest that the, the original Ten Commandments were probably also out of limestone, and they could have looked very, very similar to what you're seeing here. Um, this is another one from the uh, Luxor Museum. And the truth is, I'm not 100% sure of the date on this. I think the sign was 10th century BC, but I'm not 100%. At any rate, you kind of get the idea. Tablets of stone, cartouches for official things. The Ten Commandments may have um, looked like that. So um, I want to kind of round things off and come to a conclusion that you're probably not expecting. 
and why would I take you on this sort of uncomfortable journey comparing things and sort of placing Israelites in this, this Egyptian world, which is saturated with paganism and it's saturated with fear and slavery and bondage and, and fear of the afterlife, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> it's perfectly clear that the Israelites had spent centuries in Egypt as slaves or some other category. Nearly, nearly everything they do and build after leaving Egypt for some time is still very much of Egyptian provenance. However, what are the Israelites not taught about at Mount Sinai? And here we finally have the point I'm trying to get to. There is nothing really in Torah, and I'm talking about the first five books here, on Mount Sinai, when God gives his people his rules, his covenant, his desires, his, his teaching, his everything to his people, the afterlife is completely missing. And I'll just let that sink in for a moment. I've been thinking about this for the past year. And to the point where I finally felt comfortable to even deliver a, a Bible study like this. Um, it's worth it, in my opinion, to, to do all this comparing for that point alone. That point alone, for me, as we say in American English, it leveled the playing field. And I was not, it, no longer bothered by, you know, the Anubis or the you know, the cartouches and all the other stuff that, that I've just mentioned. The afterlife is not what God wants his people to think about. It's just so clear. <clears throat> now, I do realize that in the book of Deuteronomy, there is one law that forbids inquiring of the dead. It's Deuteronomy 18.11. And there's quite a bit of discussion about that amongst the rabbinic world, the scholar, Jewish scholarly world, um, you know, conducting seances or attempting to communicate with those who have passed on from this world, it seems to imply an acknowledgement that the living can communicate with the dead, but it forbids Jews from engaging in this activity, right? Um, a recent rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda Levi, he wrote a book called The Science of Torah. It came out in 2004. I don't think he lived much longer after that. It, he explains two traditional opinions about this subject in Deuteronomy 18. One view accepts that it is possible to communicate with the dead, but we are not allowed to do so. However, he also quotes Maimonides from the 12th century, who said, all types of witchcraft, sorcery, and communication with dead with the dead are pagan. They're nonsense, they're pagan activities. We don't even think about it. You know, maybe he's, he's got a good point. My point is that the afterlife is not something that God wants his people to even think about. And um, I find that quite uh, relieving. So my final points, it is perfectly normal to long for the afterlife, to once again see friends and family and loved ones, to be in the presence of God and in the bosom of Abraham, receiving eternal comfort as we see in, in Luke 16, 23, and tying Luke back into this. But on the other hand, the notion that we are living our lives here sort of storing up treasures in heaven and that our deeds will be rewarded in the next life is also perhaps a faulty um, practice. It's better to focus on this life and making the very best of it. I love my parents and my family without condition. It seems to me that God wanted his people to do the same throughout their journeys and through the wilderness and beyond. It's all about relationship with God in the here and the now. Our motivation to follow God 
should not be based on a concern or fear of the afterlife so that our entire lives are spent preparing for death and saving up for a worthless scroll. We should not be slaves to that sort of fear, a pharaoh of fear. God calls us to celebrate the freedom each and every year, each and every Passover, freedom from slavery, freedom from bondage, freedom from fear. And that's my point. <laughs>